Welcome to the Empower to Connect podcast, where we come together to discuss a healing-centered approach to engagement and well-being for ourselves, our families, and our communities. I'm J.D. Wilson, and I'm your host. And today on the show, we bring Becca McKay and Antila Love on to talk about how to advocate for our kids in church. Um, this is I mean, very similar to the, the other conversations we've been having around these different arenas of life and um, advocating for our kids in them. There's just some nuances to navigating that church world that uh, do not exist in other spaces. And so we brought Antila on. Antila works in um, a church context part-time, also works with Empower to Connect part-time. And so in the in the discussion of how to care for our kids, how to advocate for our kids at church, um, Antila gets to work in a pretty unique, uh, pretty awesome uh, church setting where the um, children's ministry has been um, completely transformed over the last couple of years by our, our good friend Paula Powell um, and uh, Mark Ottinger. And so uh, it's a it's a great conversation for kind of a glimpse into what does trauma-informed child care look like in this particular setting, how it's played out, but also um, some baby steps of like, if if you are hoping to get to that point within your um, church you know, context and you're not there right now, there's some good starting points there. Also, if you're just starting out um, moving to a new place or looking for a church for the first time, or maybe you've just had kids come into your care and now you're trying to rethink how you do things because you've never had to think about some of the things you're thinking about now. Uh, we got you. We're here today with some advice and some conversations, just some good starting points um, to help guide you on that journey. And so uh, without any further ado, here they are now, Becca McKay and Into Little Love. Well, we are back with Becca McKay and Antila Love, and we're going to talk today about how to advocate for your kids in church. Um, and this might, you know, obviously, as we start this conversation, one disclaimer I would give is that um, the church experience is varied. Like we, we're going to find, you know, just even saying uh, kids in church or talking about Sunday school, or whatever, some of those words might just invoke I don't know, feelings of of hurt or frustration, feelings of great joy and admiration and, and appreciation. Wherever you're coming from today, like just know we're just trying to talk about how to advocate for your kids at church. We are not advocating for denominations or one view over the other or anything like we are just trying to help you navigate this place with your kids. And so um we we've all had a I would say actually a kind of unique experience within um, this particular conversation. So we felt like, why don't we kind of share some of the things we talked about and, um, and we'll, we'll you know, bring this to the world, so to speak. And so um, Antila is part of our team here at ETC, but um, she's also been a guest on the show several different times. And so you've met her before, but Antila, for those who are unfamiliar with your work previously, do you want to give just kind of a, a you know, quick intro to who you are? Sure. Hey y'all. I'm glad to be back. Back. It's always fun. Um, my name is Antila, and I am a mom, a wife. Um, I work part time with um, Empower to Connect slash Safe and Secure, um, and then the rest of my time I spend um, at an elementary school here in Memphis. So that's what I do. And well, and then on Sundays, <laughs> um, I am a <laughs> Sure, which we'll get into that in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, so why don't we kind of, Becca, go ahead. You guys know me, but um, with this conversation, uh, you may or may not know, I serve um, with our Sunday school with like four and five-year-olds. And so have served with different ages throughout the years. But currently, like, you know, as we're recording this, just last weekend, I was, uh, you know, teaching some four and five-year-olds the story of King Solomon. And so, as we come to this conversation, just wanted to mention that because it's not something I don't think I've shared before. Awesome. Um, so, Antila and I used to be at the same uh, church on staff together, and um, I don't know actually if we overlapped or not, but before I came over to ETC full-time. Um, and so, we've had, I, I would say, like, when I say a unique church experience, I would say that positively, like that the experience created for our kids and, and the structure you're working in now and Tila, like that's, that's been there for a little bit, like it's, it's uniquely helpful. Um, and so why don't we kind of start with this, like, um, you know, for, uh, for people who are wondering, like, why would this even be a conversation? Like, why would you need to advocate for your kids in church? Like you're just going to church, just, you know, tell your kids to mind their P's and Q's, get in there and get out. Um, why do we need to even have this conversation? 
Becca? <laughs> Yeah, I think um, it's a good question. Why are like, what are we talking about here? What's going on? I think the heart of most people, most people who are serving in churches, who are going to churches is, I mean, don't we want to instill a love of God and other people into our kids? And so we are sharing this common, we may come from different denominations or different traditions, but we share this desire for young people to experience the love of God. And so what happens sometimes is especially for those who are caring for kids who've experienced some kind of adversity or trauma or who maybe have some neurodiversity, the structure of church can be pretty overwhelming. If you think about things like sensory needs that we talk about on the podcast a lot, you come into a space that's supposed to be joyful. Well, sometimes it's too loud. Sometimes it's too bright. Sometimes it's too crowded. Um, sometimes, uh, Again, we know that there's so many different ways of doing this, but in some churches, kids sit with parents during service. In others, they have children's church. Whichever of those is the case for, for kids, we have found in our work that like sometimes it's just a struggle. And so the temptation is so you can feel really weak, you can feel really alone, like maybe it's just me, maybe it's just us. So just off the bat, we want you to just say like, we see you and we know that sometimes just going to church on Sunday, as much as you deeply desire that just isn't so easy when you think about what your kids need. Um, and so with that being the case, like, yes, we want to advocate for what our kids need and we want to be aware of what's available and what's around in our, in our local communities. Yeah. I think it would be something to note that it's okay to ask for something that might not be there yet. If you're kids have needs that are, they're not being met in that setting. And so, um, you know, some of this conversation is really just to be empowering as much as anything else to say, Hey, if, if you've got like one thing that's happening in center school every single week, and it's, it's tough for your kiddo outside of that, they're having a great experience, but there's, there's this one component of it. Um, that's really hard for them for whatever reason, maybe this is a time to have a conversation with that Sunday school leader or with the children's pastor or whoever there is to, to just make them aware because we don't know what we don't know. And so for a lot, a lot of folks that are in this line of work, Becca mentioned, you know, whether you're a children's pastor, whether you're a volunteer, Sunday school, whatever, whatever setting, most people are, are stepping into that role out of a deep desire to do good. And, and to know that there are kids who are not getting to getting to have that full experience in their care most people would want to know that and want to know how they can ad adapt and, and adjust to serve um, everybody who's who's coming in well. And so one place where we have seen that um, model pretty well, and Tila and I have kind of seen that in action at um, the church that we that we have been at. And um, and so I would say, Antila, why don't you, if, if you don't mind, and uh, just kind of laying out how, how things are structured um, at fellowship within the children's ministry and, um, Kind of some of the things that are unique to that setting. Yeah. So I do have a disclaimer. I am not the one who created this program. Uh, we call it the buddy program. Um, a dear friend of mine actually started it, but I have, you know, done like a lot of the trainings for the new buddies and um, helped kind of think about how, you know, this process would work. But um, really we, I mean, we start the day with the hopes that every kid can be in the classroom as much as possible. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Becca, sometimes that is not possible and that's okay. Like we want to make sure one, that parents are feeling supported and, you know, their number is not being put on the big screen in, you know, in church or something like that. Like just like that embarrassing feeling like, oh, my child might be acting out and I don't know how to do that. You know, so we really want to provide that safe space for parents when you're in or caregivers and when you're in service, like you just think about that. We got the rest unless it's like very extreme. Um, yeah. But ideally, you know, we check in. Everybody's good. We have fidget buckets kind of close by. Um for, you know, kiddos who are needing a little extra, we will take kids out of the classroom. Like if it gets too loud, some uh, some of our kiddos don't like the music or the videos. And so they're able to come out during that time. No big deal. We can go walk the halls. We can, um, you know, sit in another room. Sometimes we take the lesson with us if they're just like not 
feeling it at all. Um, we have printouts that we can take out in the hallway and just do kind of like a one-on-one -on -one lesson or just let them talk about sports or whatever it is in that moment. We always do like that is super nurturing. Um, and we also have like, OK, we've been out here for 10 minutes. We've got about three more minutes and then we're going to try to head back in just so they know, like, I'm not going to come to church and just like play all day, which to me, it's fine. Whatever. That's a different conversation for a different day. But um, we really just put we really try to balance that nurture and structure of like, okay, you can't be out the whole time, but we'll give you time to, you know, get your needs met. We have small water bottles. We have um, like little exercise cards, you know, like hop for 10 seconds, like a bunny or whatever. Um, we have books that talk about regulation. We have bubbles, fidgets, all of that just in a bucket that we can use. And so these are, so how do parents get their kids signed up with a buddy when, when they're first coming into church? Yeah, really it is. We, it's not, well, I'll say we advertise it, but it's not like, hello, we have buddies come <laughs> join us. It's more like, you know, um, if we notice things in a in a particular kiddo that we're like, oh, maybe they need. So there, there is no, like, you don't have to sign up. We just okay. see this child is having a hard time. <laughs> Let me take yeah. them out of the classroom. Um, just so it's not like eliminate or not eliminating. What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Just so it's not like, oh, you're part of the buddy program and you're not. We don't yeah. want it to be that yeah. way. So yeah. even if a student typically doesn't need a buddy, but they are having a hard time, like we're going to take them out too. Yeah. It's not just the ones who need a buddy if that it's just sense. having that in place right it's having that option like I, what i'm hearing you as you're talking it's like man you're giving lots of options for different needs and so you've got kind of almost like floaters is kind of how the buddies are seen by the kids like a kid may not know this is my specific buddy it's more like oh this is someone that's available to help um and i love just thinking about the all the different needs that kids come to your space with we're often thinking about spiritual needs and like instruction like how do we teach them these concepts but we also have a chance to meet like you said water like we also have a chance to meet physical needs and to allow it to be a positive experience for kids which is really a beautiful thing if you think about that part of it too like especially thinking of a lot of our listeners may have kids who are um, in homeschool or in smaller school settings. Church may be one of the biggest social kind of encounters that they have in their week for some. And so you want that to be a positive and like well-balanced couple of hours. So how would you, and Tila, I mean, and I guess this question for, for both of you guys, how, how have y'all seen parents and church staff work together um, to, to meet kids needs in the past, like for people who are, who are coming in this conversation a little bit, you know, new and they're like, I don't even know what to ask. Like, what are some examples of ways you've seen parents and, and church staff work together to meet kids needs? Um, I mean, word on the street is parents love the aspect of having buddies. Like some will come in and be like, okay, well, let me tell you what happened this morning, you know, just so you're prepared. Um, <laughs> And I feel like that's helpful because they're already, they know our role in what we do. And so that just gives us that extra layer of compassion. You know, um, this one thing didn't go right for this child today. So they may be, you know, struggling more today than they normally would. Um, and I mean, we have a lot of, quote unquote, trauma informed care and practices at church. And so um, it's a little bit easier for us to incorporate some of these things because the staff is getting trained. Um, and then, I mean, the student ministries is getting trained. The buddies are getting trained. Lead classroom teachers are getting trained. And so it's just, it's there <laughs> and available. Well, and, and so, I mean, some of y'all have listened to our episode with Paula Powell, um, which we can link in the show notes because she talks a lot about this. And Paula worked with Mo Ottinger, our executive director, back in the day to kind of get all of this established um, at Fellowship years ago. Um, and 
you know, you hear Paul talk about it. It was never, there wasn't this, like they didn't come up with this mastermind buddies plan. It was like meeting little needs here and there a little bit at a time. And it just evolved into, wouldn't it be great if we could whatever. And then this is where it's gotten to. So if you're listening and you're like, cool, yeah, maybe I'll either come to church there or we have no options like that here. So this is not helpful advice people. Like, <laughs> so to, to those people, I would say that, you know, everybody starts somewhere. Like there, there is not a place that just pops up where all the needs of their people are met immediately in perfect fashion, um, seamlessly. Like this happens from people taking action and, and beginning to, to help advocate for their kids. And so one of the things that we would, um, that, that I would love to hear from you, Becca, you're in a, a different church context. You also grew up in a very different American and not non-American church context. And so, um, how have you seen, you know, have there been ways that you've seen parents and, and churches work together for their kids? Absolutely. Um, I think I'm a little, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of things and I'm trying to pick which way to go, but I I'm thinking about sometimes parents and churches work together when stuff keeps going wrong, quote unquote wrong. Um, and so sometimes the first interaction is like, this is not working for our family. And so when church staff are willing to like, listen and make adjustments or help brainstorm and problem solve, that can go a long way because parents are tired. Um, like they're juggling so much. They're coming in to be fed. And so for it to just be a negative, like Antila said, if your number pops on the screen or someone's calling you or you can't even drop them off for an hour, that can be this really just like frustrating feeling as a parent. You can feel really overwhelmed. Um, and so one encouragement would just be those of you who are members of a church, who are volunteering, who are serving, who are anything like that, just being willing to listen to a tired parent goes a long way. Um, most churches are operating their children's programming with some combination of volunteers, teenagers, people in the church who are helping. Um, it's different than like a school context, for example, where everyone has to have a bachelor's degree and has some amount of child psychology. Like you're working with people who may not have a lot of background knowledge on how do I support kids. And so as a parent, you are the expert on your kid. The hardest thing I think for parents when it comes to advocating in any setting is how much information is right and appropriate to share. So mm -hmm. I think that's where we get frozen because it's like, okay, I could write you a 12 page paper on all the things that my kid needs Right. You've gone for an hour and you're 13 years old. So how can I tell you what you need to know today versus, you know, I've seen the flip. I've seen parents that don't want to say any context. And then right. the kid is really struggling. And as a volunteer, it's like, I don't know what, I don't know what helps them. And right. so I think as a parent, if you can kind of think ahead and prepare yourself even of like one Think about our idea of scaffolding. So you may not be able to just drop them off in children's ministry the first time. You may need to go with them. If you're parenting with a partner, you may need a tag team who gets to sit in service, who gets to sit with the kiddo and work your way towards that like drop off experience. If you don't have buddies, think of yourself as the buddy for a while and yeah. find ways, you know, um, my sister is a children's is a children's minister in an, in another context, and so uh, we've been talking about like what's our background check procedures to keep everybody safe, which is a different conversation. But like parents that need to sit with their kiddo, just make sure you're going through the same volunteer process as other volunteers because you'll be with other kids too. Um, but it's just those little baby steps of. How do I show you, hey, what really helps is when everyone else is sitting at the big table, if my kid can sit in the back with some Legos, they'll be still, they'll be able to listen. Um, you know your kid. I don't know your kid. So if you can show the volunteers, if you can help them learn a little bit, that's going to go a long way. Depending on your context, again, you might have a situation where a kid is able to sit with you in service and that might be better for them. That might be a smoother transition or not, um, or that may not be an option where you are. So again, as you're listening to this, think about Maybe you need to print out a little half sheet because it's different volunteers every Sunday and you just want them to have a couple of things that help. Like when they're upset, try giving them a snack. If snacks aren't available, maybe pack one for your own kid. Like try, you know, 
singing this song with them. Try sitting this way with them. Try having them sit with their sibling. Try, like, if you can give them some pointers of where to start. Again, not the 12-page dissertation, but also not the, like, see you later. <laughs> like, push them <laughs> off. So somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, just remember, you know, like, what I think Antila mentioned this, Becky, you mentioned it, like, the the desperation that a lot of times parents are feeling when you go to that drop-off point is like, for the love of God, I, I don't need them to like, to like be in seminary while they're back here. Can they just, can you just not interrupt me? Like, can they just be back here and, and play yeah. and let me have, and I will never forget. I mean, we had a, a friend who um, no longer lives in Memphis or now other places, but uh, they, they were the sole reason that we probably even stayed in Memphis. Our first multiple weeks in, in church, we had um, a, to, we had a baby that was 25 months old and one that was 17 months old and they were, they were eight months apart and we were dropping them off. One did totally fine in Sunday school context. just kind of like, yeah, put me wherever and I'm off. The other one was losing their ever loving mind from moment one of peeling them off of us to moment, whatever, however long we made it before we had to do the walk of shame out of service to go pick them up. And uh, one week, this way three weeks in, we were almost at wit's end and then we didn't get called back uh, and we were like, it's a miracle. We walked back and this sweet girl is like, you know, bouncing her baby on her, on her, on her hip. And, um, and we're like, was she okay? And she goes, oh, she was having a terrible time, but she was like, I was just singing to her and walking around. I just figured y'all needed a break. And I mean, my wife burst into tears, like right in that moment. She was like, thank you so much. Um, and so just remember that like, you know, most people who are back there are back there because they love kids and want to be able to help. And so, um, it doesn't have to be perfect at the start because eventually where we got to was that that same kid who used to lose their mind every time going back to Sunday school ended up becoming one of the Sunday school helpers and was back there like helping other babies, you know, be able to calm down years later. And so um, that's that. I, I, what, last question before we get into some quick hitters here. If if y'all were um, talking to somebody who is visiting churches, maybe in a new city or they're just starting to try to figure out church, um, what are some things you know, we asked, Dr. Lauren Chipman, when she was on about, you know, how do you help find medical professionals on your team, so to speak? So same question, but from a church perspective, how do we help find, um, if, if, if we're choosing somewhere, what are the things we look for to find out if this is a place, a place that could be on our team? Um, I would say for specifically, if you have like a, a neurodivergent kiddo, Becca, exactly what you said, and I'm glad you mentioned it, but it's like, to advocate for your kid to bring that to the forefront and not in a like, oh gosh, I have to say this or they're going to think, you know, my child is out of control. But it's more like, no, like, hey, my child doesn't like loud music. They're fine to be in here, but can you put their headphones on? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, um, it's just like with a baby, like we always think about the babies. It's like, what time do they eat? What time do they need to be changed? What time, you know, we always have that like written down in the nursery. But if we could have that for the older ones as well, I think that would be helpful in advocating for one, your spiritual needs, because if you're having to constantly go back and forth, which again, at the beginning, in the beginning, you may have to, um, but we don't want that to be the case all the time. So I would say one for parents to truly be an advocate and to to communicate with staff, um, like you were saying, staff needs to take a beat to listen. And then I would say the last thing would be for staff um, not to communicate if the child had a hard time in that moment because it's like they're coming to pick up and if you're like okay well i noticed today that so and so it's like no no save that for another time right. um let leadership handle that you know if you're just like a not just if you're a classroom teacher and you're like hey i noticed this let somebody else know maybe like the nursery director or children's director or something so then they can call on their own time um to just say hey how did it go here's some things we noticed what do you do to support your child when this happens so mm -hmm. then on the other end i think staff can be proactive in that as well if you notice something going on in the classroom use that as an opportunity to say how can we as the church support your yeah. kiddo 
I think it's a really good question because I think like, how do you look for the right place for yourself? And it's, you know, for some people, there's lots of options for other people. There's not. And so I think some of it is like your comfort level. Do you prefer the small church where you can see where the kids are from where you are, or are you okay with a bigger church? Um, I would just say the first priority is that you as a parent feel like they're safe. So whatever safety precautions make you feel safe. And then the second Um, The church that I currently am part of, we don't have a buddy system. We don't have a lot of like um, super strict, we don't have the printed barcodes when you drop your kids off. Like we are a little bit of a different world, but we have people that are willing to try and to be creative and flexible. And I just, for me, again, I'm thinking ahead as like when, you know, if when we have kids, how would I feel? I don't think I would need it to be a perfect program, but I think I would I would start to get concerned if they weren't willing to just talk about it with me, think about it with me, problem solve sure. with me. Because yeah. nobody knows, you know, the story that Mo and Mo tells is like the church didn't have snack and one of their kiddos was like, I need to know that there's snack. And they were willing to listen to that feedback from Mo. So I think like looking for churches that are willing to hear you and take your concerns seriously, because probably what's good for your kid is going to benefit other kids that that you don't even know about yet. Um, so that would be my encouragement would just be like, find places where it, where you feel comfortable asking for help, giving thoughts, trying different things. Um, and again, within your denominational, you know, context that, that you're comfortable with, within the beliefs that you're comfortable with, and then just a place where you feel like, okay, these volunteers and this staff is going to make sure that they're safe. Yeah, I think that's huge. I, I would say uh, from our personal experience, if you are walking into a place, if you're just trying to find a, a new church and uh, and maybe not all of the skin colors in your family match. And so if you if you've got kids through adoption who or or foster care who uh, look different than you look, um, be proactive about um, paying attention as the adult, not putting your kids in the place to be at the at the focal center of figuring out what your family is doing there, so to speak. And so that that can be a really sticky situation because, well-meaning people sometimes say things that are very hurtful unintentionally. And so the best that you can prepare uh, a, a church staff or a Sunday school teacher or whatever to know, um, you know, again, an appropriate amount of information so that there is not a comment of like, this is your dad, him, he's white. And like that, that might not be the best uh, first impression for a kiddo at church. And so um, let me also just kind of throw the wrench in to say, you know, we would say, um, we, the Wilsons would say, after having this experience, we got to be a part of a, a church that was um, very ethnically diverse and, and um, uh, amongst leadership, amongst staff, amongst the people coming to the church. It is a wildly different experience for our kids than if they're the only. Um, and so the, the bet to the best of your ability um, it is always good. And I, and I realize the cruelty of saying this in, where there are a lot of contexts where this is not even a possibility. So I'm not saying this is something that exists everywhere, but when possible, making sure that your kids are not the only um, kids of of color or of, of a different ethnicity, of a different parenting or different family situation, um, the more um, diverse environment that your kids can be in, the better for that purpose where they're not singled out constantly as, oh, he's the adopted one. Or, oh, he's the one who is in foster care. He's the one. So we're just trying to mitigate, you know, for our kids, harmful experiences in church. We want to make sure that they are able to be there and and listen and learn um, the way that uh, the church intends for them to. So um, that is my, you know, unsolicited advice there on that front. Um, and Tila, Becca, any, any last thoughts before we change over to our quick hitters? Okay. All right. And Tila, what, since you're the guest, well, I'm gonna, we're, we're all three going to listen to this, but what right now are you, is something that you are uh, reading, watching, or listening to? Reading. I have two books actually on my TBR. To oh, be well, read. three jobs, two <laughs> books at a time. No big deal. I'm, I like to read most of the time, um, but they've been sitting there for a long time and this conversation is kind of spurring me on to finish but or to start um but one is called disability and the church 
And then the other one is called My Body is Not a Prayer Request. Um, And so I'm real excited in this conversation. I'm like, let me just whip out my Kindle, you know, while I'm in the car line (laughs) to see which one I want to start with. But um, I do have a a background in um, neurodiverse populations. And so this is really a passion of mine. And um, yeah, I've been doing it for a while. Awesome. Beck, is something you're reading or watching or listening to right now? Um, listen, I'm going to pick listening to uh, one of my favorite bands of all time is Johnny Swim. And my anniversary is in the beginning of October. So my husband surprised me with tickets to go see them um, in October. So I'm listening to a lot of their music so I can be ready. <laughs> ready yes, for that. So awesome. Um, I, th- th- I am the least cultured of this group. Uh, in this answer, I, there's a show on Hulu called Only Murders in the Building. It's uh, Steve Martin and Martin Short and Selena Gomez, amongst others, this year or this this season. Um, it, well, anyways, lots of famous people in it this season. I don't want to give anything away. Uh, I love we love the show. It's not I'm not a wholehearted advocate for well, all the content necessarily, but it's just well written, funny show. We love it. Um, okay, Antila, you can have. A dinner guest or two. Um, I keep saying dinner guests. You can have a guest for a meal at your home. Um, and we'll let you have a few guests if you want, if you can't narrow it down to just one. And you get to pick what meal you're having. Who's coming? What are y'all eating? Okay. I would say, does it have to be someone that's like currently living or can it be? It doesn't have to be anybody i mean it has to be somebody but it doesn't have to be any qualifier of anything like it can be dead living uh it can be a character from a book or movie you know whatever so okay becca can i pick on you to go first i need just a minute to think yeah absolutely um if i could have one person over for dinner uh, this is a tough question because i have so many that i would want to do i know um man I think I would, okay, this is going to sound really sentimental and whatever. I, if I could pick anybody from anywhere, anytime who's not currently with us, I would pick my mom, which is like kind of a no duh because she passed when I was a teenager. And I would try to make her lasagna because I still have not figured out the recipe. <laughs> and oh. so if she was able to come, she could help me tweak what am I missing there. So that it's like probably a more serious answer, but that's, that's what I would probably want to do if I could pick anybody. Well, I can't answer the question now. <laughs> well, that's what I was, I was trying to think of a book there. I was I trying to think of something like a beautiful answer. I'm yeah. sorry. I was yeah. trying to think of a lighthearted, you know, movie character too. That I could probably think of those as well. Okay. The fact that you said that is absolutely hilariously, I feel that because my mom also passed away several years ago and I have not been able to recreate her lasagna. Like there's oh, no. always something missing and i'm like is it do i need more cheese do i need more meat like what is it <laughs> <laughs> man okay so until is that is that who you would have is your mom okay well no but yes um i would have <laughs> meet Harris from a book called Butterfly. He just seems really cool. He's like the love interest of the main character, but just like his demeanor is like so chill um, that I would like want to be friends with him and okay. also be like, why do you like this girl? Because she's trash. It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And what, what are y'all eating at this meal? Oh, I don't know. It's set in Detroit. So whatever like a Detroit meal is, is what we would have. (laughs) Detroit pizza. Yeah. Um, Well, I was going to say I'd have Dave Chappelle and we would have barbecue just because I just love him. And I, well, he doesn't know me, but he would love me too if if we get to know each other. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Okay. Uh, So that's all we got, guys. We made it. We did it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, a huge thanks to Becca and Antila for joining us and, um, and great stuff from them. And I'd be remiss if I did not uh, let you know before we go today that we are uh, on November 12th, 
uh, having our first annual Global Connection event. It's called Investing in Hope. It is going to be a fundraiser for our um, the, for the mission of Empower to Connect. Um, as we are um, working on some really exciting things, that we've been pumped to share with you. Um, that night is going to be awesome. It is going to be held November twelfth um, from six to eight thirty p.m. at the fabulous Peabody Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee, um, home of the Ducks. You can look that up. Um, but uh, this is the most important thing I want you to know is that there's a very special guest who will be there performing that night that we are not allowed to talk about um, due to contractual obligations on the podcast. So what I will say is that uh, to find out who that guest is and what's going to be happening that night, also to purchase tickets before they're gone, you can head to empoweredtoconnect.org slash investing in hope, or you can click the note or the link in the show notes below and check out who our guest is that night. Um, be able to come, laugh with us, enjoy a really fun, uh, meaningful night of investing in hope together. So that'll be November 12th here in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, but you don't have to live in Memphis, Tennessee to attend this event. So we would love to see some of you here um, for more information on tickets, who's performing, um, and then what that night's going to look like. You can head to empoweredtoconnect.org slash investing in hope. Tickets will sell out, so make sure you get yours early. That's all for us here at ETC. For Kyle Wright, who edits and engineers all of our audio. For Tad Jewett, the creator of the music behind the Empowered to Connect podcast. And everybody here at ETC, I'm J.D. Wilson, and we'll see you next week on the Empowered to Connect podcast.